Hello, friends. So good to be with you today. We are in 1 John chapter 4. it has been an exciting journey so far. John is really having to deal with a number of situations there that's undermining the faith of, of uh, the believers at that time. Uh, he, he's having to warn them concerning these false thoughts, uh, the philosophies of that day that's leading people to say, how can that be, or we don't believe this or that. And we see many of the same things today. Many times, I mean, how many of you have seen young people who, who, who were raised in church and they go and spend three or four semesters in college and you got some very smart people in the college arena that have given themselves over to uh, education in one area or another and they, they literally plant seeds or undermine everything that they've ever known. And by the time they come out of there, they're so confused, they don't know what is right or wrong. Many of them have just taken, taken journeys that have led them off into left field. And that's the same thing that was happening there. And so John was writing this letter. This was the last letters that, that John wrote. He, he was writing this letter to talk about those that maybe had been deceived by these false teachers false prophets. And so 1 John chapter 4, he is he, he's dealing with these people that were denying uh, the 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 deity or the incar in, uh, 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 in, incarnation of of uh, Jesus being born of a virgin or the, and, and and even the humanity. I mean it's just they were like all over the place with it. But let's go ahead and read this. This is chapter 4 and verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit Man, if I could say anything to you today, that would be it. But don't be, just be careful what you're listening to, okay? Dear friends, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out in the world. In other words, there was no shortage of false prophets or false teachers. They were all over the place then, just like they are now. Because And, and, you, and I want to say this also. Because there are false prophets who exist among the genuine, we've got to discern what spirit they're operating by. You have to be very careful that you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater because certainly there are false prophets, but there's also genuine prophets. There's the real thing. So verse 2 said, this is how we can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus has come in the flesh, look at that, has come in the flesh is from God. Here he is attacking Gnosticism, the questioning of his deity or the questioning of his humanity. That's what they were questioning. And he was saying, wait a minute, you got to understand people need to know that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. God was made flesh and dwelt among us. That was the importance. That's the, that's the importance of the virgin birth. You know, if people can undermine the virgin birth, what they're basically saying is, is the seed was not planted into e into Mary, therefore it could not have been from the Holy Spirit, could not have been from God, and so that's that's questioning, that's that's undermining the the deity of of uh, Jesus Christ, and so he said that he said every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come. In the flesh, God made flesh, that's from God. Okay, so verse 3 says, But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus, is, the, the, Jesus Christ is not from God. And he said this, that, that very thing there, that's the spirit of the Antichrist. Or that's the spirit of the opposition to truth. That's the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. See, people... People were questioning the humanity of Jesus. They, they were questioning. And, and many people today, they question those things. The humanity of Jesus, the deity of Jesus. Uh, the, the, many religions do that same thing today. They will say, yes, we believe Jesus was here. We believe Jesus was a prophet. We believe Jesus was a good man. Jesus was a great teacher. But we don't believe that he was God made flesh. We don't believe what John said, the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. They don't, they don't believe that. 
So what John was saying is those who claim to be speaking according to the Spirit of God, yet deny that God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ, they're not speaking from the Spirit of God. If what they say is true, it's going to paint a picture and an accurate picture of who Jesus is. And that's going to be how we discern one from the other. See, God, <laughs> Jesus, let me, let me just take a, a quick little side trail here. Jesus was God come in the flesh. You've got to wrap your brain around that. He had to be a man. He had to be flesh to represent us. God couldn't just represent us from heaven. It had to be a man to represent us. He had to be God to redeem us. He had to be both. He had to be both man and he had to be God. No other man could have done this because they, they were in the process of trying to pay for their own sins. You know, I couldn't pay the debt for you because I had my own debt that I'm dealing with. And if any of us are going to pay for sins, it's going to be our own. And the only way that I could die for you is as if I didn't have a debt of my own to pay. So someone had to come along who didn't have a debt, who was innocent, who was an innocent lamb that didn't owe God anything in the way of sin or transgression, because we know that the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. So someone had to come who didn't deserve to die. And that's where we see God made flesh. So he had to be one of us to represent us. Does that, does that make any sense to you? In other words, God could not from the throne do it. An angel couldn't die for man. Why? Because it was a man who got us into this mess in the first place. Adam and Eve were the corporate representatives for mankind. He was the first Adam. Now we call Jesus the second Adam. He's the second corporate representative. And he had to be God to be sinless to conquer sin in the grave. So, so that was kind of how that laid out. And they weren't accepting that. They were just simply saying they were questioning the deity of, of Jesus. They were questioning the humanity of Jesus. They were just all over the place. But this is what John was saying. He said, you're going to know when they deny that, they're not of God. You need to stay away from them. And verse 4 said, you, dear children, you're from God and you've overcome them. And he's talking about the spirit of the Antichrist and the spirit of error. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one that's in the world. Well, that is such a powerful statement. Man, if you, could, if you could receive that for your life right now, greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. And that speaks of anyone. I don't care. Darkness, deception, no matter what comes, that which is within you is greater than those things. And verse, said, verse 5 said, they are from the world, and therefore they speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. But that's not us. Verse 6 said, we're from God. We're from God. We have the word of God. We're looking at things from the spiritual standpoint. We have the word right here. And the word is the standard by which we measure what is right or what is wrong. So he said, we're from God. And whoever knows God listens to us because they're going to listen to the word. But whosoever is not from God, they're not going to listen to that word. They don't want to hear what the word has to say. And this is how we're going to recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, the spirit of falsehood. They're going to deny the word. They're not going to stand with you in that area. Okay. Now he's dealt with that Gnosticism there for a few minutes. Now he's going to once again, begin to flip back over and he's going to start talking about the context of love and walking in love. It seems like this is a revolving, a revolving thing that John has dealt with over and over in the in this entire book. As a matter of fact, in first, second, and third John, he's had to reiterate over and over the importance of walking in love. So verse seven, he says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Love is the primary response that takes place in a life that has been touched from God. That is the first thing, because God is love. God is love. That, that everything about God, everything about the kingdom operates out of love. And if you get out of love, 
the kingdom stops operating. Your prayers get hindered when you start getting out of love. So, so he said there in verse 8, whosoever does not love, they don't know God. They're not acquainted with him because God is love. Whosoever keeps the word, you remember that? Whosoever keeps the word in him verily is the love of God perfected. So he was saying, look, we've got the word right here and the love of God should be operating in us. They reject the word. The love of God's not going to be in them. And he said, whoever doesn't have the love of God, they don't know God. And the reason is because God's love. Now, verse 9 said, this is how he showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And then verse 10 said, this is love. Now he's going to say what it is. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Can I just tell you this? I've heard people say, when I found the Lord, he wasn't lost. <laughs> You were the one that was lost. You were, you were the one that was dead in your trespasses and sins. His love compelled him to you, even in your transgression, even in the deadness of who you were. It wasn't the fact that, oh, I loved God, therefore he responded to me. No, no, no. You weren't capable of loving God. You weren't capable of anything but his love for God so loved the world. That word so means fervent, red hot. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So that's the heart of God that he reached out toward you when you weren't capable of reaching out toward him. And so whenever his love was poured out to me, it touched my life and I responded to him. So he said, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his own son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So he said in verse 11, Dear friends, since God so loved us, that needs to be given to everybody else. We ought to love one another. It, it, it should be. And, I, and a lot of people, they're just, you know, they're going through the motions, but they're not really responding to other people. I, I want to I say this to you. Your response to other people is going to reflect the relationship you have with God. Period. I can always tell when a person's in trouble spiritually is the behavior that they have toward other people. He said, verse 12, he said, nobody's ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is complete in us. And this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. Verse 14 said, and we have seen and we testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Man, I love this. Let me, let me read these couple of verses here, and we'll come back to that. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And we know and we rely on the, on the love God has given us. God is love, and whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. And this is how love was made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Verse 18 said, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love, is not established in love. You know, if a person is not established in righteousness, he's going to constantly war with acceptance. Does God love me? Is he with me? Am I saved? Am I not saved? You know, when you've been established in righteousness, that's the, that's the filter by which you judge everything, every situation, every failure. I, I know who I am in him, even if this didn't happen right. I'm not saved. I'm not not saved. I'm established in righteousness. Well, when you're established in love and you truly have an understanding of what love has done, it drives out the fear because fear has to do with punishment. I'm, I'm not worried about that punishment because I'm grounded, I'm rooted, I'm established in love. And I've been made perfect or I've been established in love. See, we love, verse 19 said, because he loved us. I'm established in that. You, you understand that? I'm established in that. And then verse 20 and 21, he said, whoever claims to love God 
yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. Wow. Wow. How you respond to others is going to reflect what's really done in you. We know we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. In verse 20, whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister, they're simply operating in deception. He, he calls them a liar. For whosoever does not love his brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. So, so I, I want to just, I want to go back to this, this cry that John has for the church. And this is something we've got to apply to our life. We've got to be established in love. We've got to be established in who he is and what he's done in us. And, and then he said in verse 21, and he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother or their sister. I'm going to say it one more time. We know we have passed from death to life because of what happens in our response to those that are around us. The number one reflection of you being saved isn't the fact that you know scriptures. It isn't the fact that you've been baptized the number one way that I know how you are changed is the reflection of what I see in your life toward other people. How do you respond? That's what's going to show who you are. Don't listen to what I say. Watch what I do. Do I respond in love? Can I just say this to you? You need to begin to live like that. That needs to be, you need to begin to pray. I, I began to pray some time ago and I said, Lord, I... I want to be established in. I want to make some decisions toward the love walk. I want to begin to walk in love. The most important thing that you can do as a believer, and please hear the context of what I'm saying here. It isn't to learn more scriptures. It isn't to understand more theology. It isn't to grasp more history. It isn't even, it isn't even to pray more. Hear what I'm saying, because you do need to pray. You need to spend time in the Word. You, knew, you do need to rehearse Scripture. But the thing you need to be established in, most of all, in your relationship with God, is going to be your relationship with others and walking in love toward them. All of the commandments of God, you read, go back and read the Ten Commandments. All of them, well, just about all of them, were connected to your relationship with other people. I don't steal because I'm walking in love. I don't, I don't kill because I'm walking in love. That's why Jesus could say, all the commandments hang on this law. Love God and love one another. And this is something that John's trying to establish in, in these people. And we're going to go in, in the next chapter. We're going to close out this, this teaching that John had here as he begins to talk about faith and the incarnate Son of God. And this is going to be very important. I want you to really pray about these, these scriptures that I've given you today. And just allow the Holy Spirit to just bring revelation out of them. We need to spend time and meditation about the context of what he's talking about. I, I mentioned this the other day. We have a tendency to just cherry pick scriptures here and there. And we really don't see the context of why he said that. And what was the motivation for the things that he has said. Okay. Well, that's chapter four. And I appreciate so much you taking a few moments to be with me today. This is very important for your life, for your study. Uh, just meditate. Spend time and just receive what the Word has to say for you. I want to also encourage you to go to jerryedmond.com. I've got a ton of resources there that you can that you can look at. I've got them all backlogged. And uh, if, if you're interested in some deeper Bible, Bible study, there's... there's uh, 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 one of the tags there will say, I believe it says videos. You can click on that and it'll show you all of the chapter by chapter studies throughout the word. And it'll be a blessing to you. Okay. Thank you for joining me today. I appreciate you being with me. Please leave a comment. I'll get back to you. And I want to say thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for being my friend. It is a relationship that I hold very close to my heart and dear to my heart. I look forward to seeing you again in the next chapter. All right. I love you guys. I'll talk to you then. Bye-bye.